I will be relatively brief. I suspect you would be rather irritated me if, with me if I wasn't, um, but I will be brief. As a very kind introduction said, I'm Dermot Nolan. I'm the CEO of Ofgem. It's a real honor to be asked to present the awards and to speak today. I'd particularly like to, ask, to thank Mike for asking me. As I said, I promise to be brief. Perhaps inevitably I will talk often in these speeches, I want to talk a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present, and perhaps to speculate somewhat about the future, and to end on a, what I hope will be a positive note, but perhaps a slightly cautionary note in one particular sense. I will probably, um, I'm afraid, touch, touch on the rather dry area of regulation more than many of you might wish to hear, but I'm afraid you're stuck with me. I'm a regulator, so hey, you made the mistake of inviting me in that regard. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the past, as was mentioned in the, in the introduction, I have the misfortune to be trained as an economist rather than an engineer, so when my team were sort of preparing for this speech, they got various interesting facts about how the gas industry developed. I hadn't known that Frederick Windsor was the f formed the first public utility company in the world in 1812, and that it's, it opened in Westminster, actually very close to Ofgem's offices, and brought gas lights to London. And basically, over the 19th century, the gas industry, I think the phrase used was spread like wildfire, which might be somewhat unfortunate as a metaphor, but nonetheless has been used. But it spread, and it had a huge effect. It brought gas meters, prepayment meters, and it brought light and warmth into people's lives in a way that really, for most of human history, they never had before. And you actually, re looking back, and looking back as an untrained, naive economist, just the sense in which that the gas industry transformed piece of people's lives in the 19th century, I think is truly striking, and something to reflect on, and in some ways something to congratulate yourself, the industry, on. I mean, there were clearly downsides. The working conditions of the time were truly dreadful. Uh, stokers who put coal into furnaces were given new pairs of clogs every month, simply because a pair of clogs was burnt out within one month, and it started to burn off the soles of their feet. Thankfully, the HSE is uh, on the piste now and makes sure that won't happen. Um, moving much closer to the present day, the industry was privatized in the late 80s. It was opened up to greater competition. And then you had the uh, blessing or misfortune, depending on your point of view, to be given a regulator, which was formed off gas in 1986, and then off gem in 1999. So, as I said, the regulator is relative newcomer to an industry that I think has a long and distinguished history. That's what I wanted to say about the past. Looking at the present day, what do I think, where do I think we are in issues facing the gas industry? Well, first and most pertinently and obviously, we have a new government. Um, we have a new government from last Thursday. As an independent regulator, I'm clearly not going to say anything about the politics thereof. It would be entirely inappropriate. But we have a new, re new government, and we as a regulator look forward to working with them. I'm sure you as an industry also do the same. If I may go back to regulatory speak and look at the supply sector briefly, um, within the next month or two, we should see the publication of the Competition and Markets Authority's provisional findings in, into their investigation of the energy industry. And we look forward to seeing what views they will bring and working with them in the future as well, particularly in the supply market, where I believe much of their attention would be seen as focused. We also have the smart metering program, where we will see by 2020, where certainly the intent remains, I believe, a, a meter, electricity and gas being put into every home in the country. So there are going to be huge changes already envisaged over that period of time. Um, and how, should I say, how policy and regulation affect your industry, I think will be genuinely important for you over that period. If I may look at one theme, that I think will be important is the sense that although the gas industry has brought light, warmth, and heat to people, well, warmth and heat at any rate, to so many Britons, there's still many who don't have gas. About a half million homes have a gas supply but no gas heating. 1.3 million homes are perceived as physically close to gas but have no connection. And over 2 million homes are fully off grid. To my mind, in so much as I can read the political runes, and I may be entirely mistaken in this regard, I think the issue of off-gas will be an issue for any government and, and any set of politicians over the next five, ten years. There's a perceived, and to my view, understandable discrepancy between those who have access to gas and those who don't. I have no idea, and I'm not going to speculate as to what policymakers might do, 
But I would suggest that that issue is going to be in the public, in politicians and policymakers' minds. And indeed, you may wish to contribute to that debate. Having said that, and having said there's two million homes off gas grid, I think the gas network is frankly a bloody good one. Um, and a network that frankly Britain can be proud of. There are various price controls, we call them in Ofgem the Rio price controls, which may be familiar to some of you in the room, if not all, which sees gas networks charged with delivering folk outputs to consumers. And I really want to focus on that. We've tried to make gas networks focus on directly on their consumers in an efficient manner. Every year, the gas distribution companies are investing over two million billion, sorry, two billion pounds in the maintenance and operation of the gas network, which is, and again, this is a fun fact I didn't know, 290,000 kilometers long, with 3,500 kilometers being replaced every year, which is actually the length of the UK motor net, motorway network by itself. The industry answers over three million gas emergency calls. 97% of the call-outs are attended within an hour. And also, I referred to off-gas, gas distribution companies in the first year of the price controls made 59,000 new gas connections, with at least a quarter of those being specifically focused on those who are fuel poor and being as identified as fuel poor. This is a positive thing. What's perhaps even more positive is that customer satisfaction in gas networks seems genuinely high. It seems to be growing year on year. We all, that's not a signal to be complacent. We want the gas networks to continue investing in customer service. But it is a positive sign, and this is a slightly cautionary note, in an industry generally where customer satisfaction is not that high. Uh, supply, I don't want to separate people into the sheep and the goats, but within gas supply, you might say, there isn't that level of satisfaction, whereas in gas networks, there is. And it would be nice in a few years' time if not that ratio had reversed, clearly, but it was equal on both sides. In terms of then the role of gas in the supply mix, that in itself is changing or has changed. As you all know better than I, that there's been a decline in North Sea gas in the last 10 years, but the industry has responded really well in building new infrastructure. If and when, and I would imagine when, when I see the Secretary of State, I think a new Secretary of State, I think I can genuinely say to her that Britain has a really diverse source of gas supply. We have gas interconnectors, we have pipelines, we have LNG importation terminals, and while again, not to be complacent, we, are, we do have a diverse source of supply, and I think that's very much in our national interest. However, and this is moving slightly to the future, the, f the demand for gas is uncertain. Whenever some gas senior executives come talk to me, this is one issue I think that preoccupies them. What will the demand for gas be like in not in 2020? It's an interesting question in itself. But what will the British demand for gas be like in 2050, in 2080? By and large, I think many agencies say there's a bright future for natural gas. It is abundant, it has low carbon qualities, and it's relatively low cost. The phrase, a golden age of gas, has been prophesied. Um, are the dash for gas. I'm not sure this is true. It may well be, but I, if I'm the cautionary note I spoke of at the start would be not to be complacent about the future. I'm sure you're not, but, you're, but I am emphasizing that to you anyway. If you look at gas power generation in and of itself, you will see that in some sense the anticipated growth of gas in the power mix of producing electricity in, um, in the UK has not risen quite as quickly as, as might have been anticipated. At the moment, and it varies from month to month, coal is still slightly more base load generation than gas. Um, so that's one particular factor. Will that change? Will gas become the base load fuel? It was certainly prophesied as doing so. It's not self-evidently become so yet. But of course, then the other perception of gas generation, electricity generation, was seen as the solution to intermittent renewables. If we're bringing on more and more wind into the system, then gas generation and flexible gas generation can fill the gap. That, I think, can, will, must indeed happen. But it's going to require flexibility from the industry. Flexibility not just in the generators themselves, but across the entire supply chain to make sure that the industry responds flexibly to the challenge of more renewable generation. But finally, and I am sort of, as I said, coming to the end, you'll be glad to hear, Finally, there's a sense of what will be the big challenges for 2050, 2080. I think broadly, though it's hard to, you know, there has been an election, but I, in my view, that any government will still be broadly committed to a decarbonisation agenda. 
There's certainly nothing that I saw in the manifestos that would indicate a major change from that. So I think there will be pressure to decarbonize. There will be particular pressure to de decarbonize of heating. Heating accounts for nearly half the energy we consume in the UK, a third of the carbon emissions. By and large, we're going to have to, and I mean this as a country, we're going to have to cut carbon emissions. We're also going to be able to have to tackle fuel poverty. In that battle, in that sense of the future, what I would say to you again is, think about it now, and don't be convinced it's a golden age for gas. It may well be. It may well be the case that people, that policymakers feel that you know, renewable generation is potentially more expensive. I'm not saying I agree or disagree in that. And that gas will be, will be the future. But it's also possible they may not. And at the moment, in my mind, there's a sense that gas is certainly there in policymakers' minds as, as a fuel for 2020. But it's, not, it's less clear to me that it's a destination fuel. Less clear to me that in 2050 and 2070 that gas will be the future as well. It may well be. And obviously, the industry should play its part in that debate and prove that it can both have gas as an efficient fuel and gas contributing to decarbonization. So I think that is the challenge, a challenge, to my regulatory mind, a challenge that the industry faces. I'm sure it can face it successfully, but I think it's very, very important to be preparing for that now. Thank you very much.